Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 234. This week, as we're still in catch-up mode, the questions are taken from guide 278 and 279, that's USS Texas 1892 variant, and the Sangamon class escort carriers, with the accompanying Wednesday videos on the Scrap Iron Flotilla, about Australian destroyers in the Mediterranean, and the American Civil War, the River War Part 2. Kendra Malm asks... I've just been re-watching your series on the Battle of Jutland and was struck by how close the fleets came during the night retreat of the High Seas Fleet. If there'd been a slight change in course or speed on one or both of their parts, they could have run head-on into each other. Seeing as neither had much preparation for night fighting, how do you see such an encounter playing out? A lot of it was going to depend on the exact circumstances. The simple fact of the matter is that yes, the High Seas Fleet as a whole had better night fighting training than the Royal Navy did in the form of the Grand Fleet. But it is a little bit more of a subtle distinction than that, as you might be able to tell from either watching that series or from reading some of the source material that I used for that series. Whilst the Grand Fleet battle line did not have a particular degree of night training, it had a little bit, but certainly nothing compared to the doctrine the High Seas Fleet had, the scouting elements, i.e. the cruisers and the destroyers of the Grand Fleet, did have a bit more night fighting training than the battle line. You see that in things you know, like the torpedoing of the Pomerne, uh, for example. Now, obviously their opposite numbers in the High Seas Fleet would again have more training and expertise on their side, but there are a few factors that perhaps balance the scales a little bit. Firstly, the most likely scenario in which the two fleets end up actually having a full-on nighttime battle would be if either the High Seas Fleet was travelling a little bit faster before, well, before it made its turn to the east, which is what ran across the back end of the Grand Fleet, because if it was, it would be slightly further ahead, and then obviously there'd be an intersection going on. Or alternatively, if the Grand Fleet went a little bit slower, and it's, you know, in the course of how far they travelled, how long it took, and how close they came, it could be the difference of a knot or two on either side. Maybe even a half a knot to three quarters of a knot if the High Seas Fleet was going half a knot faster and the Grand Fleet was going half a knot slower. That might create the correct alignment conditions. Now, if that happens, that means that the High Seas Fleet, which is a little bit strung out in a somewhat loose formation, is going to run into the starboard side of the Grand Fleet's formation, and the Grand Fleet is in a much better formation, um, much more controlled. Additionally, the light elements of the Grand Fleet, the destroyers and the cruisers and so forth, are not labouring under the very impaired machinery conditions that the German destroyers for the most part are laboring under remember a lot of them had actually dropped to below the top speed of the battleships so when it comes down to you know a light forces engagement which in and of itself is probably not going to mean that much but of course at night time when the destroyers can get a lot closer night time destroyer attacks might mean an awful lot it's actually likely that the fact the british destroyers can still move and fight at pretty much top speed is going to go a long way to addressing the imbalance in training between them and the High Seas Fleet's destroyer forces. And, of course, the fact is, if a battle line engagement actually kicks up and both fleets accelerate to full speed or near enough, you might actually have the slightly hilarious situation of the Grand Fleet's capital ships simply outpacing High Seas Fleet destroyer flotillas that are trying to catch up and attack them. And then you'd also have the fact that the High Seas Fleet would effectively be feeding its ships in small groups, mostly in ragged lines, into the body of the Grand Fleet. Now, of course, the Grand Fleet is in a nighttime travel formation. They've gone back to sailing in multiple columns, so they don't have the full battle line able to deploy immediately. But you would have, you know, four, five, six plus battleships all able to concentrate their broadsides, effectively crossing the T of gradually incoming German ships. Now, obviously, more and more German ships will start piling in, but during that time, other ships in columns further away could either be firing between the uh, columns that would be close to the action or be deploying to get better shots in in some way. So I think 
overall such a situation would probably even things out the high seas fleet still has a material training advantage but they have a massive tactical disadvantage and vice versa for the grand fleet so it would be incredibly unpredictable and it could go very much either way you know all it would take would be one lucky slightly more machinery capable german destroyer flotilla to get in the perfect launching position on one of one or more of the grand fleet's columns to make it a complete disaster for the royal navy but equally all it would take would be one or two full speed royal navy destroyer flotilla attacks and or jellico reacting swiftly enough to deploy his battleships into a kind of cauldron to draw the german fleet in to make it a fairly overwhelming british victory or something in between so whilst i would not think that i could predict exactly how such an encounter would go and while i can guarantee there would be quite significant losses on both sides i have a feeling that if he reacts fast enough jellico might be able to pull it off as a win for him because the other thing which is kind of i guess the tipping factor slightly in my estimation is that the high seas fleet contains a lot of fairly badly shot up vessels not all of them obviously but the you know the battle cruisers like especially sadlets are not in the best of shape at all quite a number of the better the kaiser and Koenigs german battleships have been quite heavily worked over whereas apart from marlborough and warspite both of which are at this point pretty much on their way home the British battle line, as opposed to perhaps the battle cruiser fleet, is largely intact. Okay, one or two of the Queen Elizabeths have been quite badly shot up as well, but broadly speaking, Jellico has a fully intact battleship line at his disposal, whereas a lot of the German ships are materially compromised already in some way, shape, or form. ATF YouTube Division asks, It seems like a lot of US naval vessels run aground. Did the US Navy manage to ground vessels more often than in other navies? And if so, why? In absolute terms, obviously no. That honour would go almost certainly to either the French or Royal Navies, purely because of the huge numbers of ships they've had for so many centuries and the fact that obviously going aground was something of an occupational hazard especially in the age of sail so if you add it up over time obviously the older navies will have had more grounded vessels if you look at the say the first half of the 20th century or the age of steam and steel if you like then capital ship wise yes actually as far as i can tell the u.s navy does seem to have a habit of running its larger ships aground a bit more often than some of the other navies in fact pretty much all of the other major navies but i don't think this is something that's particularly the fault of the u.s navy i think it's more the fault of the usa as in the physical continental landmass. because if you look at the depth charts for i don't know portsmouth plymouth southampton um portland bay brest uh roquefort etc all you know big naval bases that various british and french ships have used for years now they tend to have fairly deep water running quite close to them and then of course yes they have shallows and sheltered areas that's why they're good harbors but to get from the deep water through the shallow section to an area where you might you know dock up or anchor is pretty straightforward it's a relatively short journey and where the water really does get too shallow to be safe and you might ground there are obviously channels that have been dredged over time or naturally occurring ones depending on which port you're looking at but those ones tend to be relatively speaking linear um, they're not necessarily always entirely straight they're almost certainly not but if they do have any bends or curves to them they're usually quite shallow so you know for example following uh, the channel into Portsmouth from the Solent is not exactly that complicated at least when you look on a chart it's a slightly bending curve to the left now when you look at somewhere like chesapeake bay um, norfolk boston new york pretty much all of the u.s east coast ports this isn't so much the case on the west coast but certainly the east coast 
U.S. harbours generally seem to be in locations where there's a lot more extensive shallow water from the area where the harbour is out to where the actually you know, full-on oceanic deep water is. Which means that, A, you have to cross a much greater expanse of shallow water, which is going to make the chances of grounding much higher. But also, possibly as a result of that, the dredged channels for the deeper draft ships that they obviously have to follow, not only are navigating around various islands, but also promontories, etc., etc., to get to the harbour. And as a result, these channels tend to be significantly more meandering. Uh, if you look at the channel approaches into, you know, as I said, Norfolk, Boston, or New York, you have to take multiple turns to port and starboard in most cases in order to safely reach the port. And some of those turns are relatively sharp, which I think overall means that, especially if you're based out of a U.S. East Coast port, as I said, it doesn't seem to be so much the case with somewhere like San Diego, um, although looking at the charts further up north or somewhere like Bremerton is a, enough to give you a minor heart attack. I think the U.S. Navy just faces a, faces a much more delicate and difficult route into and out of its safe harbours. And as a result, if you have to travel through the narrow, congested waters of a dredged channel for significantly longer and you have a significantly more difficult route than it is say getting into Portsmouth or Plymouth or whatever then statistically people are going to get that wrong more often and therefore are going to go aground more often um, there may also be a small part and although this is more my hypothesis rather than something I can point to on a chart and say look there's the problem my but my other hypothesis is that perhaps the sheer size of the US works against it somewhat because for a Royal Navy deployment, for example, let's say we go back to the first half of the 20th century, you might be based at Scapa or at the Firth of Forth and you might be based there for years at a time and as a result your path in and out is going to be fairly well known to you. Um, obviously you have pilots as well. Whereas for the US, if you're based in, say, the Atlantic Fleet, you have a, something of an embarrassment of different ports that you may be calling at or assigned to over a, roughly the same period of time. And therefore, whilst you might have ships that are based out of certain ports, they're much, much more likely to be visiting other major naval destinations within their country, at least I think over that same period of time and as a result they're going to be individually less familiar with any given port access which might also contribute to it but i think even without that being a factor and obviously those of you who've served in the u.s navy please feel free to chime in about that even without that i think just the nature of the channels and the water depths outside u.s east coast ports makes it far far more likely you're going to run aground there than you are in a british or a french port for example and you know, I'm fairly sure if we did the same analysis on places like Cardiz and um, Taranto etc we'd probably find the same situation I mean heck even the approach to Wilhelmshaven when it's not covered in sea mines is actually relatively simple right up until you get to the Jade Bar <laughs> which is a little bit of a problem but it is a rather known one so um, you can you're probably going to avoid that Blue Marlin 81 asks, You often refer to HMS Renown as being an excellent gunnery ship, but I'm unaware of any major actions in which you got a chance to demonstrate this besides the action off of Lofferton. Did her crew earn their reputation for gunnery in any other combat actions, or did they just perform very well in exercises? Renown did have a few other gunnery actions in World War II where she could demonstrate her shooting. Um, she engaged at least one, possibly more, German blockade runners. Uh, she was in action at the Battle of Cape Spartivento, and she undertook a number of shore bombardment missions amongst various other roles. Now, Renown had had something of a reputation as a relatively decent gunnery ship pre-war, but it's important to remember, of course, that she had been in modernization refit for some time just before World War II broke out. In fact, she only had came back to the fleet a few days before war itself broke out in September 1939. So in some ways she inherited a little bit of a reputation from interwar exercises, 
but largely speaking, she entered World War II as pretty much a clean slate. And I think this is part of where she gets her reputation, as in why, rather than a specific action. Because, of course, during that refit, she'd been fitted with the latest and greatest in terms of fire control. And, of course, that also included radar, which she would continue to have upgraded during her service career. So I think when she then comes into World War II, what people perhaps sometimes therefore don't realise is that in terms of her fire control equipment, Renown was as good as anything else that was under construction or in the process of commissioning in 1939-1940. So she might have been a World War I era battle cruiser, but she had fully up-to-date late 1930s-early 1940s fire control, which subsequently then obviously proved its worth in actions like Lofferton and the various other things that I mentioned, where she consistently scored well in her gunnery and also scored well in her gunnery in occasional exercises which they could perform during wartime. Josh Thomas Moore asks, would you ever work as a historic advisor for a movie or TV series? And if so, what would be your terms to work as one? <laughs> well, if anybody was going to ask me to be a historic advisor for a movie or TV series, presumably it's going to be one to do with naval history. Um, I think my main terms and conditions would be obviously leaving me enough time to continue working on the channel if they want to engage me for months at a time. If they want to engage me for a few weeks, I could probably work ahead of, to build up a um, an advanced catalogue of videos but basically it, I wouldn't want it to affect the output of the channel but in terms of the actual movie or tv series itself my main terms would be actually take me seriously and listen um, so if I present them with either information that I know or information that I've found or I introduce them to other experts to give specific notes on certain things then I would ask them but I basically have it in in the contract you actually have to listen and make changes where it is reasonably possible to do and if they want to make changes for artistic like license purposes then I specifically I think I would probably say to them look that's understandable it is a movie it's not a documentary um, much as I would prefer it to be but if you do want to make changes for dramatic purposes etc then you you probably still should talk to me because I have a feeling I could probably help you draw that together you know from this is my objective that's a historical here's the actual historical well let's try and come up with something that is at least plausibly historical oh and uh, if they decide to just completely ignore me and effectively make a historical fan fiction then i would want my name removed from any association with it but i'll still take the money because hey um, i gave you the advice the hand of the king asks on the sangamon class with the engines and funnels at the stern was there any thought given to putting the bridge there so that the funnels could be trunked too sort of like how modern day u.s carriers look presumably that's the ford class what were the possible pros and cons of that kind of arrangement so very broadly speaking, when it comes to aircraft carriers, the more forward the bridge is, the better that is for ship handling. The further aft the bridge is, the better that is for air group handling. And having the island roughly halfway down is kind of the, the best of both worlds, also the worst of both worlds. And that's why you see island placement varying somewhat. Um, obviously carriers that are flush deck would have their bridge completely forward um, carry, and some carriers like Soryu or Hiryu might have their bridges relatively noticeably forward on their hulls other carriers have their bridges slump somewhat further aft etc etc but with things like navigational radar radar locator beacons and just closed circuit television cameras not really being so much of a thing in World War II the disadvantages to ship handling and navigation that you suffer by moving an island aft were quite a lot more pronounced in those days as opposed to these days where all of those aforementioned features and more mean that whilst having an island further back isn't such a brilliant idea from navigation purposes there are a lot of tools that you can use to help overcome that which you don't have in world war ii so there's actually a lot stronger of an incentive to keep the island somewhat more forward 
for those reasons with something like the Sangamon class. And secondly, you also have to remember that how the air group works on a World War II era carrier, especially an escort carrier, is subtly different to how it works on a more modern jet aircraft aircraft carrier. And what I mean by that is, if you look at, let's say, a Nimitz class these days, then if you look where the aircraft on the port side catapults are being launched from, a lot more proportionally of an aircraft carrier's flight deck length is used for the takeoff of the air group. Obviously, landing is still done aft, but a US carrier in World War II, unless you're talking about maybe an escort carrier trying to launch the most heavily loaded of Avengers, by and large, the flight operations in terms of takeoffs use a proportionally much smaller length of the flight deck, obviously on the forward end. So if you are conducting takeoff and landing ops in World War II, then if you want to position your island in such a way that looking forward you can see takeoff and looking aft you can see landing, then you actually want your island to be a bit more forward than you would these days. Now obviously an island that's right aft does give you the advantage of being able to watch for the most part landing and takeoff operations completely without having to turn around 180 degrees but in the event that you can't do that and an island right at the very back is going to cause other issues with turbulence then it's better to have your island roughly speaking at that junction point so you can have someone managing landings someone managing takeoffs and they don't have to keep twisting and turning to figure out just their particular portion now of course on a modern carrier if or modern supercarrier at least if you don't have the port side catapult set quite that far back you could theoretically have your island further forward but that would either mean a reduction of your flight capability to only forward cat catapults or a much 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 larger aircraft carrier Knight 6831 asks, what sort of ships were the 5.5 inch guns intended to be used against and was weight the reason that Hood got 5.5 inch guns? This actually all comes back to the dance that British secondary guns were constantly doing. Now, in the latter part of the interwar period and then into World War II, you had a third branch added into that particular dance, which was anti-aircraft usage, but at the time of World War One, when Hood was being designed, the Royal Navy had to take into account rate of fire and weight of fire. And the reason for that was that, of course, the secondary batteries were supposed to primarily engage enemy destroyers and possibly light cruisers who might be coming in to do a deliver a torpedo attack. If they did end up engaging enemy battleships, then that was all well and good, but that wasn't their main intention. As a result, the Royal Navy had upgraded, so HMS Dreadnought had launched with a secondary battery of 12-pounders intended purely for anti-torpedo boat work, as opposed to the 6-inch, 7.5-inch and 9.2-inch guns which had gradually been introduced on pre-Dreadnoughts, which were intended for a combination of anti-small craft and anti-capital ship work, as the calibers got larger, progressively more and more anti-capital ship work. It was quickly decided that the 12-pounders on Dreadnought, whilst they might have stopped a 1900 Zero torpedo boat, probably wouldn't stop a modern destroyer of her time very quickly. And this is where the weight of fire element comes in, because they knew at the time of the designing of these ships that the secondary battery did not have direct to fire control. By the time Hood was being commissioned, ships were beginning to have this introduced, but for the majority of the time period we're looking at for the answer to this question, they didn't. And as a result, you wanted to fire as many shells as humanly possible, because that was the way that you guaranteed to hit a small maneuvering, fast moving target. But you want because you knew that any one of those hits was very unlikely, you wanted the one hit you might actually score to be hard enough to either check the advance of the enemy torpedo boat or destroyer, which would then make it easier for the other guns to score more hits or ideally cripple or destroy it in a single hit and so a lot of world war one era royal navy capital ships had the four inch gun but then this was upgraded to the six inch gun as it became apparent that destroyers were getting bigger and tougher even though this meant you could carry fewer of them because it was then thought well you might need multiple four inch hits to stop a ship 
but only one or two six inch. The problem that this then ran into was that the six inch gun, although it was a quick firing gun in the nomenclature of the time, it wasn't that quick firing compared to some of the older guns. And for some, like Admiral Fisher, that put its likelihood of stopping an enemy destroyer attack actually below the acceptable threshold. Hence, you got the, as we discussed in previous dry dock, rather awful triple four inch, which was an attempt to reintroduce effectively the hail of fire concept using what would in theory be a faster firing weapon. Not that it actually worked that way as it turned out, but nonetheless, the idea was possibly sound in principle. But fundamentally, the reason for the slow rate of fire with the six-inch guns was that the shells, and their propellant charges for that matter, but the shells mainly, just weighed a whole lot more. They're about 100 pounds. And a 100 pound shell, that really was a little bit beyond the capabilities of the average loader to manhandle themselves for extended periods of time during something like, say, a destroyer attack at which point you either had a very slow rate of fire or you'd need additional people to help move the thing and it's still 100 pounds of mostly solid metal with some high explosive in there so it's a bit difficult to deal with the 5.5 inch gun was introduced into the royal navy thanks to the 1914 purchase dash takeover of almost every naval ship that was under construction in various dockyards in the uk in particular, a couple of cruisers that were under construction for Greece, and it was found that the 5.5-inch gun on them had similar performance characteristics to the 6-inch shell. It wasn't quite as powerful, but it was near enough, and there was a substantial decrease in the weight of the shell itself. Uh, well, as we said, the 6-inch shell had a 100-pound weight. The 5.5-inch was an 82-pound weight so almost well exactly 18 percent less weight and that crossed a little bit of a threshold because then it turns out one person could just about manhandle an 82 pound shell carefully and two people relatively easily for extended periods of time and what this meant was that you had something that hit almost as hard as a six inch gun but was much, much easier to handle, therefore could throw out a lot more shells than a 6-inch gun over a given rate of time, and that meant that actually more weight of shell would be going down range, and the effect of the impact at the other end wasn't too dissimilar, so it would probably still cripple an enemy ship relatively quickly. And with the shortcomings of the triple 4-inch becoming somewhat apparent, and ongo as we said, ongoing issues with the 6-inch still being a concern, it then made sense to switch over to the 5.5 inch which is why hood got it and why as some people have pointed out in a previous dry dock question furious also got it interestingly enough, furious is basically the break point because furious was originally designed as courageous and glorious were with triple fours and if you go to the fleet air arm museum there's actually a builder's model of furious before she was obviously completed which shows her with triple four inch but that was changed at some point during her design and build process to 5.5s. Ideally, the Royal Navy would have liked to stay with the 6-inch gun, as it meant you know, commonality with some of its older vessels, and the 6-inch shell ultimately is a little bit more powerful, but it would take the introduction of a more power-assisted loading mechanism with something like, say, the Nelsons, before they would shift away from the 5.5-inch. Christopher Rowe asks... Do you think the UK's World War I through interwar policies in regards to the fleet air arm were the best for the overall performance of British aviation during World War II? It's easy as a naval aviation enthusiast to chastise the World War I decision to merge the two air services into the Royal Air Force, but do you think the Battle of Britain would have turned out as it did had the Royal Flying Corps persisted into World War II, much like in the United States with the US Army Air Force? I'm thinking of how much better the Spitfire was in 1938 compared to the P-36, or how the Lancaster bomber was ready about three years before the B-29. On the other hand, would there have been some sea battles that went better for the British had the fleet air arm been kept independent? I don't think it was a particularly good idea. The idea of having an independent air force was definitely a good idea. There were significant issues experienced during World War I, particularly on the Royal Flying Corps side of things, because it was effectively like the US Army Air Force, an adjunct of the army. So 
separating them out into the Royal Air Force was a good was definitely a good thing. However, by also giving them what was at the time the Royal Navy Air Service, later to become the Fleet Air Arm, it did significantly limit the progress and capability of the Fleet Air Arm during the interwar period. And it, it, partly because that meant the Fleet Air Arm became the bottom of the pile as far as budget was concerned, and to a certain extent also the bottom of the pile as far as requests for new aircraft designs were concerned. For obvious reasons, the RAF, which had the majority of its strength on land, and was also interested in things like strategic bombing, which you can't do from an aircraft carrier, its focus was understandably somewhat dis distracted from what the fleet air arm required. Now, occasionally you did get aircraft like the Fairy 3, which were perfectly at home at sea or on land, a little bit like the F-4 Phantom would be later on in the Cold War era, but it usually left the fleet air arm lagging a little bit behind and forced, in some cases, to make do and mend with what they had, even though that's a, a World War II motto. Uh, for example, I think if the fleet air arm had had full control of all the aircraft designs, that it was allowed to have, it might not have gone for something like the Skewer, a supposed hybrid fighter dive bomber. Broadly speaking, they may still have gone for two-seat two fighter aircraft, because that was very definitely Royal Navy thinking, but if they'd had their own separate budget, their own separate ability to call for designs completely independent of the RAF, then they, I think they might have looked at somewhat more specialised aircraft for the varying roles. And there's also a degree of competition that you would have, because if the fleet air arm, for example, if they decided, right, we want some single-seat fighters, then if they have a design that works for them, and the Royal Air Force is off having a design of single-seat fighter that works for, the, for them, objectively speaking, one of those is going to be better than the other. Um, obviously each one will have been designed somewhat specifically for their needs, but it's extremely unlikely that you're going to end up with two aircraft with identical performance profiles made by two different manufacturers to do different specifications, which would then afford, by having two separate design competitions, yes it would cost slightly more, but in the end you'd probably actually have at least one aircraft come out of that, which the other service, again shades of the F4 Phantom later on, could look at and go, no, actually, that thing is actually genuinely just better, so we'll have that, which would have been a good idea. Um, I mean, for example, you know, if the Royal Air Force develops the C, even if everything goes vaguely according to how it did before, and the Royal Air Force has developed the Spitfire and the Fleet Air Arm has developed the Skewer, then when they're looking at the two, they've, if the Fleet Air Arm then goes over to Supermarine and says, well, we'd like a, a naval version of that, by being completely independent with a long history of being completely independent, they probably have a little bit more advanced time and a bit more clout to actually say, right, no, we, this is what we're going to get. Um, obviously, historically, the Fleet Arm had just about got its independence back when the Royal Air Force yoinked their design for a navalised sea fire from under their legs in order to have all the airframes and engines for the Battle of Britain. Uh, but I think the fight would have been a little bit more uh, knock down, drag out, and the Royal Navy might have got some of its properly navalised Spitfires in 1939-1940 if they'd had that you know historic weight of office behind them. Or they might just have realised the problem earlier and gotten them made earlier before it became a significant issue. It would also depend on what the extent of the Fleet Air Arms remit was as an independent service, because during the interwar period the fleet air arm was basically limited to carrier and catapult aircraft aboard ships whereas if the royal air force focused purely on land-based air defense bombers and bomber escort then perhaps the fleet air arm or maybe it would still be called the royal naval air service at that point might also be looking at float planes sea planes and maritime patrol aircraft which would expand its remit considerably more and obviously allow much better coordination for things like the Channel Dash rather than Coastal Command traveling to try and re relay and ally with the Navy. It would all be under a single command structure. Brendan Boersdorf asks, Would it have been feasible to modernize the last generation of American monitors, or were they so obsolete as a ship class that it's just impossible? 
I think it depends what you mean by the last generation of American monitors. If you mean the last generation of Civil War era monitors, then no, I, I don't think there's really much you can do. In theory, yeah, you could probably refit their engines with more modern units 20 years down the line. Um, but realistically, although weight-wise, you could probably replace their 15-inch Dahlgrens with maybe a 9 or 10-inch 30, 35, 40 caliber weapon, just about maybe make use of some of the displacement saved by using slightly smaller, more efficient uh, 1880s, 1890s engines. Ultimately, what you're going to get is still a slow firing platform for some armored cruiser grade guns on a hull that is never going to compete with an armored cruiser for top speed and is still limited very much to coastal defense. So you could maybe make them effectively kind of a mobile harbor defense gun battery that could threaten raiding cruisers but at the cost of basically almost completely rebuilding the ship which would probably be better served just using the money to build an actual cruiser <laughs> now if you mean the last generation of monitors as in absolutely what was the last generation of american monitors that were built aka the arkansas class back in the at the very end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries there's some things that could be done with them, but it depends what you want to use them for, because the Arkansas are, in a lot of ways, kind of coastal defense battleships by another name, albeit very small ones. They're not particularly fast, although I suppose they don't have to be. They have a reasonable amount of protection for their time period, and of course they're just armed with a single twin turret up front. If you wanted to modernize them for the purposes of maintaining their deterrent value as a coastal battleship, well, I, I don't think that's really going to work, because, amongst other things, who's going to come and attack the United States in the 20th century on their own coast that requires battleships to deal with? Um, but if you wanted to repurpose them as shore bombardment vessels and modernize them that way, the way the Royal Navy was actually building new monitors in World War One, then it might be a bit expensive, but yes, in theory, you could do it. I mean, they've got vertical triple expansion engines. I'm not necessarily sure they'd gain a huge amount by upgrading them to turbines, but it might save some space and weight, so that would be useful. They're Existing 12-inch guns are probably just fine for shore bombardment, but if you want, there isn't a huge amount of difference between the 12-inch 40s in terms of weight and 12-inch 45s, which you find in the latter American pre-dreadnoughts and early American dreadnoughts. So you could give them a fairly easy firepower upgrade. And if you drop the belt armor, uh, which, of course, you know they've got because they're originally kind of micro coastal defense battleships but if you say actually no well they're just going to be shore bombardment vessels and as a result we don't particularly need them to be protected because if they get under heavy fire from a coastal battery they're probably dead anyway and maybe strip that down to just destroyer proof armor that'll save a fair bit of weight as well which might allow you to either further upgrade their firepower or you know if you stick a bunch of bulges on them as well um maybe get them up to a little bit quicker. So you could, I think, in theory, rebuild the Arkansas class as full-on coastal bombardment monitors, a bit like HMS Terror, but that's about all you're going to get out of them, I think. Donovan Lawler asks, While playing World of Warships, I noticed a lot of ships available are design variations or designed but never built ships. What of these sorts of ships do you think would have been successful had they actually been built? And why were these designs and variations not used? As for why these designs and variations weren't used, the list of reasons is almost as long as the number of ships. Um, but usually it comes down to one of three things. Either there wasn't the resources to complete those ships, or there wasn't the money to complete those ships, i.e. the Navy might have well wanted that vessel in service, but they were looking and going, well, if we can get this variant, we can afford, let's say, six of them. But if we get this variant, which technically is the better one we'd kind of like, but the government will only give us money for four, 
and we need six, so I guess we're going to have to go with six of the small ones. And the other thing is just mission parameters. You know, what is the Navy trying to achieve? The designers come up with a range of different options, and, you know, even, even not accounting for things like do you have the resources to build it? Do you have the time to build it? Do you have the money to build it? And if you do in enough numbers, it may also be that just another design variant works better. So you can take, for example, the ship that's gracing screens right now in World of Warships, the Georgia, which loosely speaking is kind of an Iowa, but with twin 18s instead of triple 16s, and without commenting directly on the specifics of the design itself versus Iowa, more broadly speaking, the US Navy had done various analyses where they'd looked at the 18-inch versus the 16-inch gun when they were considering what to build for their new fast battleships, and they'd come to the conclusion that more 16-inch 50s would actually offer a better broadside and better capabilities than fewer 18-inch, and therefore it was better to go with some kind of design with triple 16s rather than twin 18s and then that kind of goes off into the more detailed design studies that will eventually result in Iowa. As far as which ships or variations would have been the most successful, that is actually quite an interesting question because it's easy to point out to which ones would have been better on paper at the time of construction, but what would have been the most successful allows us to use hindsight and that actually changes the equation quite a bit for example i really like my plymouth because plymouth is essentially what belfast and edinburgh were initially supposed to have been i.e expanded town class with um with four quadruple six inch turrets instead of triples on paper you know adding another th four guns to the class gives you more firepower uh, makes you a much nastier opponent overall is a superior ship but when you look at how the town class and particularly belfast and edinburgh performed in world war ii the number of six inch guns once you reach beyond an acceptable number and 12 was a reasonably acceptable number um once you get beyond that with hindsight it doesn't really make much odds. sure it would have made slightly better shore bombardment um and so forth but overall, the town class, if they were going to take losses at all, are which they obviously they did, are more going to be more concerned about anti-aircraft firepower. And having quadruple six inch instead of triple six inch is going to increase the overall weight of the main armament relative to the overall mass of the ship, which would then make the Belfast and Edinburgh, if they had been so equipped much less capable of taking enhanced anti-aircraft batteries which in turn would have probably not stood them in good stead particularly for Belfast for the survivor in the post-war environment where the fact she had a great reserve of stability and a displacement meant that she survived to be the museum ship she is today whereas with the quad sixes probably she wouldn't have and then, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, you have ships designed for the Regia Marina, the Kriegsmarine, and the Imperial Japanese Navy, and with the best will in the world, whilst individually some of them may have seen a bit more success than the historical designs, on the flip side, you know, they're probably just going to, I mean, they're not going to win the war for their respective countries, they're most likely just going to end up sunk as well, and therefore you know as a not particularly war affecting weapon that requires a lot of resources they would have been overall net negatives um albeit obviously then you could like i suppose spin that back again and say from the perspective of the allies anything that takes resources away from the main axis war effort and makes them easier to beat is a good thing so you know there you go but if you're looking at let's say allied vessels something like the surreys for instance probably would have been fairly successful britain was forever hurting for heavy cruisers during the war and just by their existence especially since that's supposed to be a follow-on or you know continuation of the county class run rather than an alternate to the county class just having more heavy cruisers almost regardless of anything else would have been a good idea
And then you've got things like the Constellation, which exists, which is basically a modernised Lexington-class battlecruiser. And we've discussed many times on the channel previously about how if some of the Lexington hulls had actually been completed as battle cruisers, then they might have served very well if assuming that they'd been at least retrofitted, if not fully modernized in the interwar period, as fast carrier escorts from the beginning, which may have, or may not, you never know, but may have saved Lexington and Yorktown, for example, at Coral Sea and Midway, respectively. Lieutenant William Bush asks... In Friedman's U.S. Cruisers, page 245 and 478, it stated that the first two Cleveland class, CL-55 and 56, were originally ordered in 1939 to an 8,000-ton design that was in compliance with the Second London Naval Treaty. Armament was to be 10 6-inch 47 caliber dual-purpose guns in five twin turrets with no secondaries except for 21.1-inch. If it's assumed that the dual-purpose armament had been available and performed as planned, how do you think this design would have compared in World War II service to the actual as-built Clevelands? I.e., would they have, for example, would they have suffered the same lack of margin problems as the Crown Colony class? Well, um, here's a Cleveland because uh, apparently, you know, actual drawings, etc., for the original 8,000-ton design are hard to come by and usually of fairly low quality. Nonetheless. Um, if this class had entered service, that you know, part of the question is a huge, huge what if. Because assuming that the twin six-inch dual-purpose guns work, i.e., the Worcester's guns, I mean, the Worcester's guns didn't work particularly well when the ship was launched at the towards the end and after World War Two, let alone before World War Two. But if you know, for a moment, we magically hand wave away that problem and we say there's some kind of dual purpose capable six inch armament going. Um, yeah, the, I mean, technically speaking, that would give them a slightly larger heavy anti aircraft barrage than a historic Cleveland because a couple more barrels pointing skywards and a heavier shell but rate of fire is going to be a lot less than a five inch 38 so overall i think actually the historic cleveland's probably had an advantage plus of course with the historic cleveland's and you know they even they had um, weight and stability issues towards the end um but they're much bigger hulls so they're able to fit a lot more light and medium anti-aircraft guns on and you've got to remember that in the early to mid part of the war, it's the light and medium anti-aircraft guns that are making all the difference. The 5-inch 38 is a good heavy anti-aircraft weapon, but it really comes into its own once you get A, radar-directed fire control to set the time fuses, and B, the VT fuses, aka the radar proximity fuses, later in the war. And an 8,000-tonner, especially with five twin turrets to account for, is going to have very limited space to eventually replace those five quad 1.1 inch and adopt more 20s and 40s so yeah i think overall the the cleveland's as designed as built um would actually have done significantly better than the 8000 ton compromise design which to be fair nobody in the u.s navy particularly liked they were just designing something that complied with the treaty requirements and yes they definitely would have suffered from the same lack of margin issues as a crown colony class um, i suppose on the one hand if you've got five turrets it's somewhat easier to sacrifice one but then at the same time the crown colonies dropping one of their triples leaves them with nine guns dropping one of the twins on this thing would leave you with eight guns which basically gives you a slightly oversized leander with less heavy aa um if the main battery is engaging with something else uh, the same amount of heavy aa but bigger guns if it's able to purely direct its guns into the anti-aircraft role but yeah they, they they would have had significant issues with top weight once you introduce radar and all the medium and light aa that you'd need etc into the equation Dr. Irrelevant asks, in an earlier dry dock, you mentioned there were no real equivalents of Yamato for wooden sailing ships, ironclads, and pre-dreadnoughts. If such Yamato equivalents had been built, what would they have been, in your opinion? 
So obviously this would require a lot of what-ifs to occur, but in theory for wooden sailing vessels, I would estimate that a Yamato equivalent for a wooden sailing ship would probably either be if the largest calculated reasonable figures for Zheng He's treasure fleet are correct for their largest ships, and one of those had somehow meandered its way into northern European waters around the time of Zheng He's expedition, and then someone taken it in and gone, oh, right, I'm putting lots of cannon on this thing, then for the time period, that probably would have been a Yamato equivalent. If the claims of HMS Duke of Kent are seen here being designed in the latter part of the 1800s, I think it's 1807, if those are correct, then Duke of Kent would have kind of been a late age of sail Yamato. For ironclads, especially when you look at Yamato in terms of both bigger guns and just sheer size compared to treaty battleships, I think the only way you're really getting an a an ironclad era Yamato equivalent would be if someone had taken aboard one Royal Navy Admiral's suggestion of buying the SS Great Eastern and presumably turning her into HMS Leviathan and then armoring her up. That would have been an ironclad age Yamato. Um, and as for pre-dreadnoughts, well, to be perfectly honest, a Yamato to pre-dreadnoughts is basically dreadnought. Um, if you want to stick completely with the theme of Yamato, including the larger guns, I suppose you could argue maybe an eight-gun dreadnought laid out a bit like South Carolina, but carrying a 13.5-inch armament instead. But yeah, realistically, the dreadnoughts are the Yamatos of the pre-dreadnought world. Chazix asks... During the Age of Sail, how much discretion did a captain have in where and when his ship would sail, assuming that he's part of the Royal Navy, and how would that differ in other major navies of the world? I vaguely recall answering a question similar to this at some point in the past, but nonetheless, um, broadly, captains in the Age of Sail had absolutely massive amounts of discretion compared to today, apart from anything, because it was physically impossible for anyone to communicate with them in real time or even close to it once they'd gone over the horizon. I mean, sure, you could send letters out, but you had no idea if or when they'd arrive. Now, this assumes a solo voyage, and it also assumes a rather broad mission parameter. This is where things are going to get a little bit more complicated, because if, for example, the captain is told there is a sail, a, a convoy of 250 sail heading out. You need to protect it. You don't have a lot of discretion at that point. You stick close to the convoy. You might have a little bit of discretion about exactly where you place yourself in relation to the convoy, but you're going to be fairly restricted in your operations. Conversely, if you are part of a battle fleet, uh, then again, discretion is not really a thing. You'll be told you, you sail in this part of the line and you will do what the Admiral says. If you're sailing on blockade duty, you might have a little bit more discretion, but you're still confined to within fairly strict mission parameters. Whereas if you are told, um, you know, go and blockade this enemy's coast generally, or go and raid enemy trading, or, you know, something along those lines, something with a fairly broad mission parameter, or, or perhaps in peacetime, just go and patrol this half of a continent and make sure that nothing particularly bad is happening at that stage, that's when you have huge amounts of discretion because you are the ultimate authority. You're not answering to a squadron or fleet officer at that point. And as long as you vaguely do your job, i.e. You know, sail in this approximate part of the world and shoot at things you're supposed to shoot at and don't shoot at things you're not supposed to shoot at, then you pretty much can do whatever you like. Um, Obviously, you can't just laze around and wait for things to come to you, for the most part, but as long as you're sailing vaguely in the direction of where you're supposed to, you have a massive amount of latitude. Now, with other navies of the time period, it depends to a great deal on which navy you're looking at, because you know a French frigate captain who's been sent out to raid enemy commerce is going to have you know as much latitude as a Royal Navy captain who's been sent out to raid enemy commerce. Uh, 
but you might have other navies which don't have these kind of massive ocean spanning expeditions going on either during times of peace or war smaller navies with a much closer environment and a much smaller fleet are necessarily going to be a little bit more strict about what you do with their ships and how you do it so for example in the baltic the russian baltic fleet or the swedish fleet etc you know, if you're only sailing out for a few days at a time and the Navy has a more constrained budget, they're going to be very particular about telling you where you can sail, when you can sail, how many people you can have aboard when you sail, what you're supposed to do while you're out there and when they expect you back. Um, but that's m not so much a specific thing to do with the naval attitude. It's more to do with just physical realities on the ground. Richard Rogg asks... Rowing gunboats, i.e. small gu boats with one or two small guns, a sail and 20 to 30 oars. I've heard the Swedes invented them in the early 19th century, and I know the Prussians had a few of them stationed on the Danholm near Stra Stralsund in the 1840s. Uh, what do you know about them? Are they a unique Baltic phenomena? They're not a unique Baltic phenomena, unfortunately. They're actually relatively common but also not, which is incredibly unhelpful, I know. Uh, but basically, they, they exist in some way, shape or form pretty much throughout the Age of Sail, either specifically designed or ad hoc, but they flare up into prominence and then die down again a little bit, off and on, depending on either circumstances or occasionally politics. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, in somewhere like, say, the entrance between the North Sea and the Baltic, then they can be very effective. They, they do have significant weaknesses. They can't go very far. Um, they can't withstand particularly high seas. They're not the world's fastest ships. And, well, if somebody directs a 24-pounder cannon at them loaded with grape shot, you can pretty much cripple one in a single volley if you get your, your aim right. But because they are powered by both oars and sails at a very shallow draft, then in shallow waters like various parts of the Baltic or, as I said, the pa passage between Denmark and Sweden, they can be very effective if you're forced to use them. So the Danes, for example, they originally wanted to have their own version of a full Age of Sail battle fleet, but after two lots of Copenhagen, that was clearly not working out so well for them, so they resorted to mass fleets of gunboats, and they had a limited degree of success with those. Um, this particular diagram in, is for what's a so-called Jeffersonian gunboat, and uh, this was Thomas Jefferson's great idea of getting rid of the early US Navy and relying on militia armed with fleets of these things to try and see off coastal attackers. Um, the, they are work as i said within reason um but it's more that they exploit gaps where other ships fail rather than being a particularly overwhelming force on their own so as i said if you're operating in very 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 shallow waters or if you catch a larger ship out when the wind has died as almost happened to hms africa at one point then they can be very affected by swarming attacking areas where bigger ships can't aim going into areas where other ships can't go and so on and so forth but they can't project power very far from the coast they're far more vulnerable to weather as we already mentioned and if the wind is up and a large ship with lots of guns therefore is able to sail and maneuver they're on a bit of a hiding to nothing and if the coastline isn't full of hundreds or thousands of islands and shallows and shoals and inlets and etc etc then again their effectiveness is much reduced as the US Navy both recognized and would later find out. Um, it, they were really nice and cheap to procure but whilst the US East Coast and portions of the Great Lake do have more shallow areas than a lot of other areas they're nowhere near as congested with islands and shallows as the Baltic for example is in order to make those gunboats actually an effective first line or only line of defense. And finally for this week, Greb asks, what is your opinion of Admiral Dewey? Now, of the various naval officers whose life stories I've read, Admiral Dewey is not one that I've read a huge amount about. Um, 
I've read a reasonable amount, but nothing to the same depth as, you know, someone like Admiral Lee, Admiral King, Admiral Cunningham, Jellicoe, etc. But from what I have read, he seems to be a pretty competent officer, um, certainly had uh, a very courageous at head on him during the American Civil War. Uh, he seems to have been generally a relatively likable, well-mannered person, fairly forward-thinking for his time. And whilst the gunnery at the Battle of Manila Bay was laughably inaccurate, to say the very least, at the same time, I suppose, it, it's a little bit difficult to... Well, quite difficult to fault Dewey personally for that, because he opened an engagement at what, for the time, was a fairly considerable range but without many of the benefits that were enabling thoughts about gunnery at that kind of range to be considered at the time. You know, things like the deployment of rangefinders across the fleet, etc., etc. And at the end of the day, he still won the battle with minimal to no casualties. So, you know, even if he did expend an inordinate amount of ammunition to do it, it's still overall a success. So, yeah, he seems to be a pretty decent, solid officer. And uh, one that you can't really find too much to take personal objection to, which is actually somewhat rare when it comes to uh, 19th century naval officers, especially ones with any particular notoriety. And that wraps us up for this week. Thank you very much for listening, if indeed you still are, and I hope to see you again in another video soon. Bye bye.